We have a legend with us today. Larry Wall is the creator of Pearl, the benevolent dictator for life at the Pearl Project. I don't want to be a legend yet. Oh, too early, huh? Yeah, too yeah. young to be a legend. <laughs> yeah, I'm only 61. <laughs> uh, I think, I'm sorry to say, Mr. Wall, you are a legend. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not a bad thing. It's really not a bad I, thing. I live about a quarter mile from the History Museum, the Computer History yeah. Museum in Mountain View, and I try to stay out of there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be history. You yet. don't want to be history yet. Yeah, they'll, put it, they'll stuff you and put you up on the, <laughs> on the wall there. Uh, Pearl 6 coming out. Actually, it's in beta already. Mm -hmm. um, and that's big news because it's been, dare I say, 15 years yeah, in yeah. the making. That's longer than the original Pearl, I would imagine. Well, it depends on how you count. Um, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get to Pearl 6. I want to talk a little bit about you, too, though. I, um, uh, we have, as I mentioned before we began the show, a, a broad variety of viewers, some who are expert Pearl users, and they'll have the expert questions for you, not me. Mm -hmm. But I, I think a lot of us are also very interested in, uh, in you. and in when, So tell me a little bit about uh, uh, your start. Uh, were you a computer science major in college? Uh, no, I actually started off majoring in uh, a double major in chemistry and music. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Uh, and uh, majored in uh, a few other things in the middle. I'm one of these people who stretched four years into eight. Yeah. Uh, well, we're from that great generation yeah. that brought us uh, so much innovation. But I, I was fortunate to go to a college that let me. Uh, <laughs> That's nice. Let me yeah. uh, kind of figure my. I was a late bloomer. So. Do you remember your first personal computer? Well, of course you do. Everybody does. Well, my first personal computer was actually an Amiga because my, I, I, the uh, all the computers I had before that were at work. Big ones. And they, yeah, they were. Well, PDP-11, if you count right. that as big, yeah. uh, Vaxes and such. Uh, you know, they were always much more powerful than you could get on the desk. So, uh, yeah, we waited and until so our kids came along and they, they needed something. So we got an Amiga. An Amiga. Yeah. I still have it. Do you? Yeah. You ever ever booted up? I haven't for a few years. Yeah. We have one. Uh, I think. I think the one we have is is it a four thousand? We have one in the basement. Yeah. We, we we trot it out every once in a while. <laughs> we had it up here on Saturday. We were interviewing the guy a guy who's still selling floppy disks. And so we brought everything up in the basement that still uh, supported floppy disks, including an Osborne one, yeah. an Amiga. There's a bunch of those in the Computer History Museum. Yeah, too. yeah, I have one of my own downstairs. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's, it's my history. So, uh, when you got, did you stay in music and chemistry or did you get interested in computers at well, some I, point? Well, I got or? interested in uh, Classical Greek, Koine Greek. Um, for a while I was pre-med major, but I, Probably not because I really wanted to be a doctor. I just wanted to take a whole bunch of different sciences. Yeah, see, that's not what just, I did. Not just chemistry. I, I got was a tired. Chinese major. I was interested in stuff, right? Yeah, it wasn't I, pre you know, I've always had the problem of being interested in too many things. And uh, so, uh, but eventually, um, I, uh, uh, while I was stretching out my uh, college career, <laughs> I was working uh, full time and taking one course a, a, a quarter and met my wife and uh, we got both interested in linguistics. We uh, I love linguistics. We're planning to um, uh, be field linguists uh, in Africa, and uh, so we were studying uh, with a uh, uh, professional linguistic organization that also uh, uh, works with a missionary organization. We were going to be go out and be Bible translators. So I learned a lot about languages. Um, I had to create my own major, however, because the linguistics major at our college. Um, required two foreign languages. So I had all the, uh, the basic courses uh, uh, and one language, which was Greek, and I persuaded them to substitute a smattering of computer languages oh, for, um, how interesting. for the other uh, language requirement. And my, my uh, major was called Natural and Artificial Languages. Very and interesting. I thought I was doing it just to get out of school. It turned out to be quite a... Uh, um, a prediction of what my future career was going to be. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, though. Do linguists consider uh, computer languages kind of l languages, human languages? Uh, most of them don't. Um, you know, they, they think uh, both the linguists and the computer scientists tend to think of computer languages more as a mathematical sort of right. construct. A formal description of a problem uh -huh. and solution. And... Um, I felt it was my, my specialty uh, to be able to take some of the, uh, the ideas from how a natural language works and apply yeah. them to uh, computer languages. There are nouns, there are verbs. Yeah, right? uh, yes, and, and to, but not so much on a surface level. People think, well, you could just make English like COBOL 
but that's a very surface level right. of how a, right. uh, a human language works. The, the, the deeper uh, ways in which we um, use metaphors and, and, and things that are similar to each other, take this and use it as that, uh, and let them kind of interplay in a, a computer, science, computer scientist would call it, you know, in a dwimmy fashion, do what I mean. Right. And how do you do that without losing control of what the computer is going to do is, uh, is uh, an interesting problem. Well, it, it makes sense because, after all, the human brain works in a particular way. We Language is our particular facility as humans. And if you're going to try to get a computer or a machine to do something, it makes sense that whatever mechanism you use to do that is going to end up being kind of linguistic mm -hmm. because that's how we communicate, right? Certainly. Um, and a, a lot of people think that the purpose of a computer program is to speak to uh, the computer. Like a conversation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just as important the communication with the other programmers around you and to your future self. Um, More importantly, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, you know, as I say, I always assume that whoever reads your code is is an axe murderer with a, a grudge. And, one of my favorite. And that might even be you. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite quotes. Six months from now. <laughs> so this was at University of California, Berkeley. He has a graduate student. As a graduate at, student. You met at Gloria, Cal, who's yeah. here, by the way. Well, we actually met up at Seattle Pacific University. Oh, you met at Seattle Pacific? Yeah. She's going, no. Yeah. <laughs> Seattle Pacific. But then you both went to Cal. Yes, we yeah. did. We were both yeah. in the linguistics program there, yeah. met some, some really famous uh, linguists. Uh, George Lakoff, Charles Familiar, Charles Fillmore were, were some of our professors. Do you still love linguistics? Is that still a, a Oh, you, you can't stop loving linguistics. Yeah. Um, the way it often comes out, though, is, is my wife complains that uh, anything she says to me, if there's any ambiguity in it, in it whatsoever, <laughs> I will misinterpret it in, intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank goodness for the holes. Huh? That's yeah. really... <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's what's interesting. That's because actually what takes, it, it takes that to be a good language designer because um, people, a lot of people think they're good language designers, but they don't see where the holes are. Right. Where the ambiguities are and the traps that people will fall into. And ambiguity, of course, is not what you want when you're instructing it. Well, you, you, to do things. You, you don't want unintentional ambiguity. Right. Or, or as we say, unintentional uh, genericity, to use a more technical term. Um, and this is why, actually one of the reasons why we decided to uh, uh, redesign Perl in, in, uh, starting in the year 2000 was there were some places there where it was unintentionally generic, mm -hmm. unintentionally ambiguous. So uh, that was part of the process. Uh, it's, it's always a learning thing. You're never perfect on it. Of course not. And there is no such thing as a perfect language because right. um, one of my favorite books is by Umberto Eco. It's called The Search for the Perfect Language. And it's, it's not about computers. It's about all these ancient ideas of how uh, a, uh, uh, a perfect language should work. You know, is it Hebrew? Is it Latin? Is it some philosophical language that I can make up? You know, is it, is it Lodge Ban, right. <laughs> uh, Esperanto? Right. And um, there's always trade-offs. Uh, the good language designers, it's funny. Uh, we all get along quite well with each other. It's our, it's our followers that tend to get into fights because we all understand that how many trade-offs we made right. um, and which trade-offs we made. So, uh, yeah, uh, ambiguity, uh, what, what we've discovered, uh, a lot of the problem is, is assu assuming that you can parse a piece of program and then go back and reparse it as some other language, you know, in retrospect, you know, right. in reverse, and that, that is... Uh, how usually you, you end up with uh, accidentally being in more than one language. Right. Um, I've heard it said that, that the language really conditions what you think you can do and what you can do. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can either have a, uh, a strong or a weak Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Right. I, I'd buy the weak one, but not the, okay. not the, uh, the strong one. Um, languages don't really differ in what you can say. They differ in what they make easy.